Today, I'm going to do something I haven't been able to do in over two years. I'm going to build a brand new gaming PC using all brand new components, all of which I got at or below actual MSRP. Really, all of it. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host, CJ, and before I get into all of this, just a quick note, I'm still suffering from a cold. I think we all know what a cold is at this point in time, but if I say the word out loud, this video will probably get tagged as containing controversial content. But in any case, I'm on about day seven of my cold symptoms, and it still got me down quite a bit, so you may tell my voice sounds bad, and there'll be more than the usual amount of jump edits as I stop to catch my breath and cut out a coughing fit, but I'll be good. As of today, I feel like I've turned the corner and I'm luckier than a whole lot of others, so still blessed. And I'm driving on with this video because I gotta say, I'm a little excited about it and I'm also a little nervous. Excited because I'm doing what I started out doing on the channel over two years ago, showing y'all how to build an affordable yet powerful gaming PC that by definition delivers great price to performance and I'm a little nervous because well it's been a while and I don't want to screw it up but seriously it's been a while because PC build and PC related videos have really gone nowhere views have completely dried up because nobody wants to watch a video of some youtuber building a PC that they can not actually build because that youtubers the only one who can actually get all the parts needed to build the PC. Everything here I purchased within the last week and I got at or below MSRP. And that includes, let's just address the elephant in the room, the graphics card, which is this Asus Phoenix RTX 3050. So the first question is, what is MSRP? And for this card and three others is $249 US. In addition to this ASUS card, EVGA, Zotac, and Gigabyte also released RTX 3050 models that sold for $249, which was the first legitimate surprise to me. There are actual MSRP cards that board partner sold at MSRP. The second question is how or where did I get it? And that's less peachy because it was pure luck that I got it through the new egg shuffle. I got up early on launch day and refreshed the normal online retailer sites, seeing as usual, no listings to an immediate out of stock listing, while Newegg put every single RTX 3050 behind the shuffle. So when the shuffle began, I selected the four $249 cards and later that day, lucky me, my number came up and I had this Phoenix in my cart to purchase. Now, say what you will about the shuffle, love it, hate it, don't give a shit about it. It's a system and it does do an okay job of eliminating the bot problem. And it and the EVGA queue are the only two online ways that I've got feedback from viewers saying that they've got new cards at not scalper prices. Or if you're lucky and have a brick and mortar like a micro center nearby, the odds in their queue are well, much better. Camping out at micro center Denver was how I bought the last card at MSRP I covered on this channel the RX 6800 way back in November 2020. So yeah, it's been a while since I reviewed a graphics card and to be completely honest, this isn't necessarily a graphics card review video. To truly do a legit review, you pair the card with the top components, CPU, motherboard, RAM, you get it. Eliminate all other potential bottlenecks to see how the GPU truly performs. And those reviews are all out there. You guys have all your go-to creator or reviewers to get that information. To be honest, when it comes to graphics card reviews, I only really watch two channels. Basically, unless the host name is Steve, I'm probably not watching it, or for pure data anyway. So I'm not even trying to compete in that league. This is just pairing the RTX 3050 with appropriately priced and spec'd components in a realistic PC build and seeing how it holds up in gameplay. Pretty informal. I'll just quickly intro the rest of the components because this is a complete system build. First, the CPU I'm going with is the 12th gen Intel i5-12400 6-core 12-thread 4.4 gigahertz processor. 
this isn't a complete base spec build, so I stepped up from the fully capable 12100 to get those extra cores for doing a little gaming and some multitasking, and for reasons you'll see in a bit. This is also a micro ATX build, so the motherboard is the ASUS Prime B660M-AD4. And honestly, this was just a necessity buy as it was one of only two B660 micro ATX boards available, but I've always been happy with the ASUS Prime series. In terms of their gaming lineup, it falls under the Tough Gaming and the Premium ROG series and delivers a good feature set at very competitive prices. This came in $50 cheaper than the Aorus MA. TX option. It's a DDR4 board, so I got a 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair DDR4 3200 MHz Vengeance LPX RAM. Now I don't necessarily need low profile memory for this build, but I've always loved this particular memory kit. It's run perfectly on its XMP profile and is very good for overclocking and fine tuning, especially latency clock tuning. And the price has dropped back down to $64 for the 16 gig kit, so I snatched it up. The boot drive is a 1TB Sabrent Rocket Q M.2 NVMe. It's a Gen 3 drive, but that's not a huge deal in a gaming PC. I went with more capacity over more speed you'd get from a Gen 4 drive, but the same $89, you can get a 500 gig Gen 4 drive if that's more your preference. My storage drive is a 4TB WD Blue HHD, which actually isn't on the table right now but yes mechanical drive but four terabytes of space for sixty dollars is a good trade-off the power supply is a 500 watt enermax cyberbron i also picked up another vetro v5 cooler for this build the 12400 does come with the new intel stock cooler but that's just barely adequate for heavy use and the vetro is probably still the best price to performance tower cooler available so this is a great $32 upgrade and it includes mounting for the LGA 1700 socket. Now to wrap up the PC itself, everything will be housed in this MuseTech MK7 MATX case. Now I'm really over the RGB thing and I was actually looking at the Thermaltake S100 or the Lian Li 205M for this build, but then I came across this and for the same $80 price tag, the features, you know, the mesh front, four fans, including a 200 millimeter front fan, you can't really beat that value. Plus I can always turn the RGB off. So that's the PC, but I also have the peripherals for this build, including the brand new MG510 wireless gaming mouse and the KG722 65% mechanical keyboard from Deepcool. So that leaves us with the display and this is Acer EI342CKR 34 inch WQHD. So 3440 by 1440, 144 hertz, 21 by 9 curved monitor. Now, this isn't necessarily the display I would pair with this build. I think 21 by 9, 1440p gameplay is a little too demanding for the RTX 3050. I actually got this for a different setup revamp video. That should be hopefully next week, so be sure to get subscribed for that. But I'm using this first because it's a $450 display I picked up open box for $300. It's brand new, it was just missing the HDMI cable, which I'm using a display port, so $150 well saved. And also because I wanna see what the performance difference between regular 16 by nine gaming at 1080 and 1440p is compared to ultra wide resolutions. What kind of performance loss are we gonna see with this 3050 trying to drive those extra pixels? Because with the cost of ultra wide, higher refresh rate monitors like this dropping, they're becoming more popular even for entry-level gaming systems, so it's time we start seeing benchmarks that include these resolutions. All right, that's everything. There are links to all this in the description below if you want more info or to see current pricing, but at the time of filming, the PC itself comes in at a cost of $963.93 US. I was shooting for under $1,000 and I hit it. All brand new current generation components under a grand. Haven't been able to do that in a long time. The peripherals are another $610. Granted, the keyboard and mouse are provided review units and I only paid $300 for the monitor, but at MSRP, the entire system comes in at $1574.93. But now the question, how does that $1,000 gaming PC perform? Well, let's get this thing built and find out.
Okay, it's two days later, I feel a little better, but let's talk build experience real quick. And what makes a build is really the case. And first, let me say, this is definitely a cheap case, both in price and quality, but that doesn't make it a bad value. The low gauge steel construction is definitely a bit flimsy and fit and finish isn't great. There are obvious gaps, especially between the case and the plastic front panel. The open mesh on the front is great for airflow and cooling, but the lack of any type of filter will lead to dust building up in the system really quickly. On the other side of things, the magnetic hinge glass panel is very nice. The pull ring and magnetic latch allow for very quick and convenient access to internals. Despite being an MATX case, there was plenty of room to work and although a tight fit, I was able to get the motherboard in without having to remove the top fan. The fact that there are four fans, especially the huge 200 millimeter front intake fan, is again the reason I went with this case. It also has an included fan slash RGB hub that connects all the fans, which is nice, but there's no PWM or any way to control the fan speeds. So they just run at full speed constantly. And you could probably hear that makes this system pretty loud. Overall, I don't have any major concerns with the build, with the exception of the fact that there's no USB-C ports at all. The motherboard does have a 20 gigabit per second USB header available, but the case doesn't have the port for it, and the motherboard rear I.O. doesn't include USB-C either. Once the build was complete, the system did post and I installed a fresh copy of Windows 11. And again, because this is an overview of the performance of this system as built as a whole and not of its individual components, I tweaked the system for best performance. In the BIOS, I enabled the CPU to be able to boost to its PL2 power state as often and as long as possible. I enabled and selected the ultimate performance power mode in Windows. I defaulted to prefer performance in the NVIDIA control panel settings. And in MSI Afterburner, I dialed in a conservative overclock curve of an average of plus 175 megahertz on the core and plus 200 megahertz on the VRAM. Despite those tweaks, the total system power consumption maxed at only about 235 watts. And at first, GPU temps did peak in the low to mid 70s, but I dialed in a more aggressive fan curve, which kept peak temps in the low to mid 60s, which is also where the Vetro V5, using just the default curve, kept the peak CPU temps. Again, almost exclusively due to the case fan, the system was quite loud, but not loud enough to come through like a gaming headset. So with the gaming PC built and tuned, it's time to see how it games. And I started with a couple of synthetics. First, 3D Mark Time Spy, and it resulted in an average score of around 6960, which if you look at the graphic subscore of 6643, that's higher than any of the other reviews I've seen on the 3050, including the more expensive factory overclocked models. Anyway, because this is an RTX card, I also ran Port Royal, which is an RTX specific benchmark. And again, I ended up with a score about 100 ports higher than the median point of the numbers I've seen on this card. Now, that's not to say I think this is a go-to card for ray tracing, but combined with DLSS, it's a doable option. I'll demonstrate that a bit later, but now let's get into the gaming benchmarks. And again, I wanted to see how this system performs across various display resolutions. So let's start with Red Dead Redemption 2 and the presets I'm going with is the very first balanced tick on the slider, set the texture quality to high and everything else at default and it's locked in the Vulkan API. Now all benchmark data is captured with Rivatuna stats even if it's a canned benchmark and for Red Dead Redemption 2 I just captured the last scene of the benchmark. And looking at the results we see a very expected result. Starting with our most demanding WQHD resolution of 3440 by 1440, we have an average frame rate of 47 FPS or 22% below our 60 FPS cutoff. And then when we cut the pixel density down by 6% to a standard 2K resolution, FPS increased by 21%. And then at 1080p widescreen, we are well above 60 FPS average, taking another 13% jump when we step down to standard 1080p. 
Additionally, we see the gap between 1% lows represented in light blue and average FPS in dark blue go from 16% at 3440 by 1440 when the system is more GPU pound to just 22% at 1080p when it's much less GPU bound. And this is because despite being the lowest spec 6 core in the Alder Lake lineup, this 12400 is a speedy CPU. Now, I haven't done any head to head testing of this CPU. And I probably won't. I'm pretty sure Gamers Nexus has. So really, that's all we need. But I just built my son a gaming PC using a Ryzen 5800X. And just in gaming performance, this 12400 feels on par with that. Again, no hard data except these numbers right here do demonstrate it's definitely a good gaming CPU. But the last bar on the graph represents that same 3440 by 1440 resolution with DLSS performance mode enabled. And now we go from well below our 60 FPS cutoff to nice smooth 60 FPS plus gameplay. Now I've seen lots of comparisons of the performance of the 3050 to the 1660 Ti or the 1070 Ti. And first this card, this one that I bought and I'm testing cost less than either of those did at launch. Never mind inflation adjustment and neither of those nor any GTX card has DLSS, which is kind of huge because while we see here that at 2560 by 1080, we have very playable frame rates with DLSS, you can get the same performance, but with a huge quality improvement. That's a 42% increase in pixel density. And anyone who's gone from 1080p to 1440p gaming knows what I'm talking about. Now, of course, not all games support DLSS, but more and more do. So if they do, I'll include the results because DLSS does take this great 1080p gaming PC and makes it a good 1440p PC. Here's another example. We see Cyberpunk gets exponentially better as we go from not really playable at WQHD resolutions to great at 1080p, even maintaining an average 60 FPS at 2560 by 1080. And with DLSS enabled, we get the awesome widescreen 2K resolution at 1080p performance. Doom Eternal at the Ultra preset had no trouble running on the system at any resolution. And although the DLSS implementation isn't as mature as say Cyberpunk is, it still gave us a 23% boost in FPS at WQHD res and more significantly, a 45% boost in 1% low performance, cutting the margin between 1% lows and average FPS from 37% to just 20%, which resulted in noticeably smoother gameplay. Horizon Zero Dawn did tighten things up a bit, giving us about the same performance with standard 2K and widescreen full HD, both giving us really playable frame rates, while again, DLSS took us from below the 60 FPS cutoff to well above it at WQHD resolution. Now, not every title has DLSS, and when we look at a very GPU bound title like Borderlands 3, the RTX 3050 struggles and can't maintain 60 FPS average at 1440p resolutions using high presets. Clicking the presets up to ultra at 1080p, only the 16x9 standard full HD resolution can maintain above 60 FPS. The same is true for Halo Infinite at medium and high presets. The system as built shows without DLSS, it's really best suited as a 1080p gaming machine or a very competitive esports system as F1 2020 on Ultra is, well, fire at any resolution. Now, to further demonstrate the esports and DLSS performance of the system, I jumped on Fortnite and at 3440 by 1440, I dialed in some higher texture settings and using DLSS, I was able to maintain an average frame rate of 100 FPS while I took in the sights and lit up some noobs. I'm just kidding, I barely know how to play that game. Now, I mentioned this isn't a card I go to for ray tracing performance but it does have the RT core, so I tested them out. So at the 2560 by 1080 resolution in Cyberpunk, I enabled ray traced reflections, shadows, and lighting at medium, and again, engaged the tensor core, so DLSS performance. And although it did drop below the 60 FPS target, I would call it playable 
for well this game anyway and i got to take in some of the eye candy that really does make the game so much more visually stunning okay now final test one of the reasons i went with the six core i5 alder lake not the i3 12100 is because many gamers do more than game while they're gaming so i did a bit of multitasking and streaming so i opened up my discord voice chat i had spotify on in the background and i had obs studio up streaming or recording in this case some gameplay using the onboard nvenc encoder and you can see i wasn't dropping frames in the game or stream okay final thoughts and i may be a bit biased here just because like i said it was just really exciting to be able to build a brand new pc at a reasonable price again now i realize i was one of the lucky ones that scored a 3050 at actual msrp i'm sorry if you tried and didn't succeed to be clear i've lost the shuffle way more than i've won but i did win and i built a really great mid-tier gaming pc if you happen to get your hands on an rtx 3050 i think this is a great setup for the card again very strong 1080p gaming rig I wouldn't necessarily recommend a widescreen for AAA gaming, but for esports or battle royale type games where absolute triple digit FPS isn't necessary, or for DLSS enabled games, then yeah, that extra horizontal real estate is great. The total system price to performance is outstanding, especially for the 2022 market, but for any market really, but of course, lucky guy i got the 249 dollars 50 i know but i think the better deal that anyone can get is the 200 dollars i5 10 400 like i said i have no idea where this place is on the benchmark charts with say the six core ryzen 5600 but it feels really close and at over a hundred dollars cheaper wherever it falls it's definitely a better value i mean i don't know i could be completely wrong I don't take sides i just want the best performance for my money i don't care who delivers it so i guess the real question is what would have i paid for the rtx 3050 and i think in the current early 2022 market probably up to about the high 300s 380 or 390 is probably the max and that isn't because of where i think the card performs in line with the cost of past cards i explained why you can't compare the msrp of this card to older cards in my last video i'm going with that price because once you hit the 400 dollars price point in the current market now for just 40 or 50 dollars more you have the rx 6600 readily available and that card has just much better raw performance than this one like i said no sides at 250 to 380 dollars the rtx 3050 the better value at 450 the rx 6600 if this rx 6600 continues to drop in price and ever gets back to its 329 dollar msrp i take that over the 249 dollar rtx 3050 that's it but call the action for this one who else grabbed the 3050 at or real close to msrp let me know in the comments while you're down there be sure to hit that like and maybe consider subscribing i hope to see you in the next one until then stay safe